It's the sound of ideas from Ideastream Public Media. I'm Jenny Hamill. Thanks for joining us this morning. Four years ago, the first presidential debate between then-President Donald Trump and former Vice President Joe Biden was held right here in Cleveland. And if you don't remember, it was filled with interruptions, shouting, and crosstalk, despite moderator Chris Wallace's pleas for order. It was what NPR political correspondent Domenico Montanaro called, quote, maybe the worst presidential debate in American history, and it led to this moment of tension. I'm not going to answer the question Why because, would you that because question? the you question want to put is a lot of the new question Supreme is Court justice, the radical question, left. Will you who shut is up, on, man? Listen, who is on your list, Joe? This Who's is on your so right, gentlemen. This is, I think this we've is ended so unprecedented. Yikes. Well, tonight at nine, the pair are heading into their much anticipated rematch, the first presidential debate of the 2024 election. Hosted by CNN's Jake Tapper and Dana Bash in Atlanta, where there will be no live audience and there will be some new rules instituted. First, microphones will be muted unless a candidate is directed to speak. Second, candidates are not allowed to bring pre-written notes or props. And third, a coin toss determines podium positions and the order of closing statements. Biden won the coin toss, according to CNN, and will be positioned on the viewer's right. And Trump chose to deliver the final closing statement. Today, we're going to spend some time talking about this debate, including what issues voters care about and the overall state of the race and whether this debate will have any impact on helping voters decide in November. We're also going to talk about the potential for a certain Ohio senator to be named Trump's VP pick. Joining me for this conversation, we have two political experts, Dr. J. Cherie Strawn. She is the director of the Bliss Institute of Applied Politics at the University of Akron and a professor of political science. Thanks so much for calling in. Thanks for having me. We also have Kyle Kondik. He is the managing managing editor of Sabado's Crystal Ball at the University of Virginia's Center for Politics. He's the author of The Bellwether about Ohio's historic role in picking the president. Kyle, thanks so much for calling in. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. If you'd like to join the conversation, have a question for either of our experts, or tell us where you, you're going to be watching tonight, call 866-578-0903. You can email us at soi at ideastream.org, or you can tweet us. We're at Sound of Ideas. Well, Kyle, one of the major elephants in the room that'll be in the debate is that Trump was recently found guilty of 34 criminal charges in New York, becoming the first U.S. president in history to actually be convicted of felony crimes. But then, in the converse, you have Biden's son, Hunter, who's also convicted on felony gun charges in Delaware this month. Do you think this is going to be a major part of tonight's debate? Uh, I would imagine that 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 would come up, particularly Trump's legal issues. I don't think the Hunter Biden stuff really matters one way or the other. It may be that Trump's legal problems don't matter that much either. Uh, but, uh, um, you know, w- what you have seen is that, you know, the, the polls really haven't changed much since uh, since Trump's conviction. Um, there has been maybe a little bit of weakening amongst independents, although Republicans also seem kind of fired up and angry about the about the convictions. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, I would imagine those things will, those things will, uh, will, will come up. I think Biden's problems, I don't think they're really related to his son. I just think that People aren't judging his presidency as being all that all that successful. And that's, you know, that's that's a much bigger problem than his son's legal problems. And and, and Shuri, do you agree? Do you think voters care really about uh, about these convictions, about, you know, uh, uh, President Biden's son also having criminal um, criminal charges laid against him? No, I would agree with with Kyle that the, the Trump base does not care and, in fact, the fundraising shows was fired up and and more supportive of Trump after those convictions. But this debate is intended to get people's attention who are not paying attention to politics or right? to pull them in a little bit earlier is why the Biden campaign wanted an earlier debate. And, and so those swing states are going to be won at the margin. And there was a little bit of movement with independent voters. So, of course, I think Biden's going to bring that up. I think he will also bring it up in order to needle Trump uh, because he wants Trump to lose his temper and get angry and show that he's not presidential. Um, vice versa with the with the Hunter Biden. Um, I think most people who are paying attention to politics um, 
you know, that's the president's son. He's tried to stay out of it. Um, you know, not going to impact uh, Biden's support. But again, I think Trump will bring it up in order to try to get a rise or evoke a, a strong reaction. And speaking kind of of the animus on stage, I mean, there are these new rules put in place. Kyle, what do you think of them? Is there still going to be a lot of crosstalk like the clip we just heard from four years ago? Um, it is something that we tend to see at debates. Um, you know, I just think about having watched so many of these things over the years about how, like, if the if the rules change, it, it, it's like you, you you prefer the past rules. So like I could imagine tonight, um, you know, in response to you know the debate clip you, you just played a minute ago of you know Trump talking over Biden and Biden talking over Trump and all that, you know, there isn't going to be as much crosstalk because the the mics are going to be muted. Uh, and then I think a, a reaction might be, well, why didn't they get to engage more? <laughs> you know, it's always like. Uh, you know, you, you, you want something you don't have. Uh, and, uh, uh, I, I actually, I do kind of think it might be, might, might try to, it might trim the sails on Trump a little bit in terms of his, uh, you know, he, you know, people just have this, or a, a lot of voters have this concern about his behavior and, um, maybe, uh, this, this sort of helps to, to mitigate those problems because it, pre- it sort of prevents him from exercising his worst impulses. So then let's talk about one aspect of, of, of what's been uh, said at Trump rallies. Um, Cherie, he's repeatedly criticized Biden's mental ability given his age. Trump is 78. Biden is 81. So not that many years apart, but there is an optics uh problem that Biden has when it comes to his faculties. And if elected for a second term, Biden would be 86 when he left office. So how much do you think this age or mental ability will play into tonight's debate? This is absolutely the thing that Biden needs to do. In addition to 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 trying to explain um, his economic plan and how he's trying to improve the economy and, you know, speak to um, you know, speak to his policies. The other thing that Biden needs to do is shore up. He needs to come in and and behave the way that he did and perform the way that he did for the State of the Union, um, and to prove that he has his faculties that that he can speak in depth and in detail to his policy agenda and what he'll do going forward, and and to persuade people that he can uh, manage that. And that's in fact why the accusations of drug use and things like that are happening is because. You know, Biden did show that he could do that at the State of the Union, um, but they've set expectations for his performance so low Mm -hmm. by calling him senile and, you know, repeatedly bringing up the age um, issues on the Republican side um, that they're trying to they're trying to, you know, level up those expectations so that so that Biden has to perform at a higher level. And Kyle, would you agree with Cherie's sentiment that in some respects, you know, this aspect of 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 criticism um, and and people questioning whether his mental faculties are there is the president's, I guess, Achilles heel. And does he potentially have everything to lose with this aspect in the debate tonight? Well, look, I I, I agree that expectations are pretty low for him. And I'd also say that uh, I think Biden, you know, he, look, he's never been known as a great um, public speaker through his very long career in, in politics. I will say that, you know, in, in 2020 and then also in some some of his big speeches since he's become president, I feel like he's he's generally stepped up to the plate on those things, particularly the State of the Union from earlier this year. Again, it, this is all in the eye of the beholder. Probably lots of people watched it and didn't think he did well. Again, I, I thought he did. And, you know, when you're painting your opponent as essentially this, this senile invalid, and then he comes out and is able to, you know, make his point, um, he's able to, to, to cross the, or, you know, jump over the low bar that, that you've set for him. And so um, I, I, I do think that, that it's, it, look, if Biden has some sort of horrible slip up tonight or loses his place or something like that, will be a big story coming out of it. But if he delivers a competent performance, it may end up looking like a great performance given the expectations. 
Again, if you want to call in and tell us, are you watching the debate? What kind of issues or topics are you hoping to hear from each candidate? Please call in 866-578-0903. You can email us at soi at ideastream.org. We did get an email from Lorraine who says, I fully affirm the no audience and muted microphone, but why no notes? Um, Either of you want to take a gander at why you think that might be advantageous? to one or the other to not have notes? You know, I'm pretty sure that that's, a, that's been a rule in past debates, too, that you're not allowed to bring anything in with you, although I think you're allowed to have a, a historically like a pen and paper. Um, and I guess the, the idea is just that um, you're supposed to be, you know, you're supposed to be showing your sort of knowledge of things and not, you know, cribbing off the, cribbing off the notes. But I, I, what, whatever you think of it, I don't think that's a new thing for debates. Yeah, it's not new. It's been the rule for some time. Okay. So let me ask both of you this. You know, the entire nation and maybe other parts of the world, people will be watching this debate. It is high stakes. But when it comes to the race um, and the polls showing them, you know, neck and neck, what value is this debate for each candidate and who do they need to be talking to to move the needle in this race um, in their advantage? Kyle, I'll ask you that question first. Well, you know, if you, uh, if you read our crystal ball newsletter, we just had a story this morning about um, uh, basically how, how Biden is doing pretty well among people who uh, not strongly but somewhat disapprove his job performance. And you'd think that in a presidential election, you know, the president's going to win the people who approve of him and lose the people who disapprove of them. But there's this big block of people, it's maybe going to be like 10 to 15 percent of the electorate, who say they somewhat disapprove of Biden. And Democrats were very competitive with that group in the 2022 midterms, which helped them, uh, you know, kind of salvage that election. Mm -hmm. And Biden is is, uh, pretty competitive with those voters now. Uh, And so those are the people, I think, who are the kind of the key swing voters. And, you know, for Trump, it's to, hey, you don't like this president, vote against him. And for Biden, it may be you know, hey, you may have some problems with me, but you don't want this other guy to be in. And so that's, if I was thinking about the campaign, that's who I would be thinking about uh, appealing to. And do you think there are specific voters in specific states he'll be talking to, they'll be talking to? Well, I mean, look, the the election really does boil down to probably like six or seven key swing states, you know, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan, a handful of others. Um, And one of the things that comes out in the polling of these somewhat disapprovers is that they do skew young and they do skew non-white, and those are generally speaking more democratic-leaning liberal constituencies. Sure. And you know, I think Biden just has some some more base weakness than than Trump does, and that's why I guess I mean, look, if you look at the polls right now, I think you'd probably say that that, that Trump is going to win, but I think it's probably more complicated than that because I think that that uh, Biden has some probably a little bit more growth potential with the people who might be sort of on the fence. And if if you're trying to make an affirmative case for Biden, that's probably what you'd look at. Yeah. And Cherie, based on what Kyle said, I mean, do you agree that that it's the swing, uh, you know, these voters in these swing states that that really need to be uh, addressed and and have this debate resonate with? And what kinds of issues do you think they want to hear about? Um, Sure. And I think on, on top of that, the other thing that Trump needs to do especially in the swing states, is um, a lot of Trump's supporters are actually more disengaged. So getting their attention and, and that getting their attention might be by performing aggression, right, by performing the way that he does. Um, he needs to make sure people who are disengaged and less likely to vote. Biden needs to turn out the people that came in 2020 and 2022. Uh, Trump, in addition to that, needs to um, to, to mobilize people who are less likely to vote, who are his supporters. And, and then again, in the swing states, um, but overwhelmingly what people, including young people, um, the polls are showing, um, want to hear and talk about are economic issues. Yeah, talk a little bit more about that. Um, you know, so even, um, you know, there was some polling that came out from the Harvard, um, Harvard does a study of young voters. Um, Young voters overwhelmingly care um, about bread and butter issues, right? We, we want to label young voters as progressives and that, you know, because of the campus protests, we want to sort of frame them as caring about um, Israel and Hamas and Palestine. And, and they do. And there is a small subset, right, of young voters that care intensely about that. But overwhelmingly, when you drill down what young voters say they 
are prioritizing, the bulk of them are housing prices, the cost of higher education, um, stagnant wages, inflation, right? The sort of the same bread and butter issues that many people in, you know, other older generations are, are caring about. Um, so speaking to those issues and, and how those are going to be addressed across the industrial Midwest where some of those swing states are, I think is incredibly important. And then, Kyle, another major issue. We've seen it in Senate campaign ads here in Ohio that's not even on the Mexico border, but the issue of immigration policy, a big one in this race. How do you think uh, the candidates are going to position themselves or talk about immigration tonight? Uh, I do think uh, the, the the economy is, is the bigger problem for Biden than immigration. Trump does have big advantages on the, the general immigration issue. Um, and I think that the public has this way of of kind of reacting negatively to the party in power. So like when Trump was in office, it was that he was too hard on immigration. And now that Biden is in office, it's that, you know, he's, he's, he's too soft. And so maybe the public maybe gravitates more toward Trump's position since he's uh, since he's not in office. He's the, he's the challenger in this election. Um, I, you know, again, I think Biden's problems are more economic than immigration, although, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we saw Biden do, do some executive orders recently related to immigration. So pretty clearly the White House believes that this is a problem that they need to do something about. Um, and it's going to come up in in all of these, uh, you know, in, in, in all of these uh, uh, Senate races, too. Um, you know, again, I, I think it's I think it's probably more of an issue that kind of fires up Republicans as opposed to moves, um, you know, undecided and, and independents. But again, you know, I think the White House is basically tacitly telling us that, that they have a problem on this. And I think part of the reason to do those executive orders is that Biden has something to talk about during this debate. So I'm sure it's going to come up and I'm sure he's going to use that as his way of, of talking about how he's dealing with the issue. All right, now let's move on to uh, the topic of VP candidates. I know that Trump has already said he's picked his vice presidential candidate, is expected to announce in the coming weeks. Ohio Senator J.D. Vance said yesterday on Fox News he'd be disappointed if Trump doesn't select him as his running mate. Um, Who are some of the other possibilities and how do you think it can impact this race? I'll ask both of you this question. Start with Cherie. Um. Sure. I I mean, I think um, we always see presidents picking vice presidential candidates that they think can um, pull a state along, pull a swing state along, um, you know, give them uh, regional or geographic um, strength. Um, So uh, we might see, um, you know, we might see a J.D. Vance, for example, strengthening Ohio, not necessarily a swing state, but but strengthening ties to the Midwest, like in Pennsylvania or perhaps in, in Michigan and in nearby states. Um, we know that Rubio is on the list, right? The, uh, you know, another governor um, is on the list. Um, it'll be interesting to see uh, which way Trump goes. And I think he might be, depending on his debate performance, I mean, I think this might be a campaign strategy that if Trump does not, if Biden does really well, and, you know, Trump feels like he needs to change the media cycle, dropping that VP announcement right after a bad debate performance can can change what everyone is talking about. So that might be his hanging on to that announcement might be his ace in the hole. Kyle? Yeah, it does seem like the, the VP choice could come at any time. And, you know, usually it comes in the days right before the convention, which is July 15th. Got to remember, there's an important date on the calendar too, July 11th, which is uh, Trump's sentencing in the New York case. You know, maybe the VP announcement would be used sort of right after that to kind of change the subject. But but uh, you know, I also agree that that maybe it could come come sooner in the coming days, even if uh, um, if, if if there's a need to change the subject after the after the debate. You know, my general sense is that running mates don't really matter all that much. I did think it was interesting that. Um, the Trump campaign released a couple ads this morning, and one of them um, kind of talks about basically how infirm Biden is, in, in kind of a kind of a lighthearted way. But um, you know, they do mention Kamala Harris potentially serving as president at the end of the ad, and so that is is part of the messaging. You would think in, a, in an election where, frankly, both the candidates are so old, and there's particularly concern about Biden that the running mates might take on outsized importance. I don't necessarily think that that's it's going to be the case, but but I thought it was interesting that that Harris showed up in that in that ad. Hmm. 
We got an email from Mark who asks, how do you swing the silent majority to the left? Does real issues win those prized independent voters that both parties want? For example, food on table issues such as the economy or the Israel-Palestine conflict. Can you win the Islamic back to the polls in Michigan? He goes on to ask, can Biden still win the women vote with abortion issues? Uh, Sheree, how much do you think that comes into play when it comes to recent movement by the Supreme Court, you know, in our state of Ohio, when it comes to abortion? And can that move female voters to Biden this election? Yeah, I do. I do. And I think that that issue was um, the importance of that issue was underplayed and misunderstood um, all along, you know, right after the Dobbs decision, I heard, um, you know, national pundits saying like, oh, you know, in three months, women won't care about this anymore. In three months, women will be talking about, you know, inflation or, you know, grocery store issues and things like that. Um, that's a complete misunderstanding of how intensely, you know, many women on the left um, feel about that issue. And, you know, even in states like Ohio and uh, Michigan, where, um, there have been ballot initiatives, right, and there's been movement um, to protect access to reproduction, uh, reproductive rights. Um, you will you will likely still see that issue, you know, being used to mobilize and swing people, um, women in particular, on that issue. And and of course we see Harris, right, the the proxy going out and has been on a you know nationwide tour, sure. um, playing up that issue for Joe Biden and saying, you know, do you want two more Supreme Court justices, right, appointed by Trump, who will who will solidify this opinion and solidify, you know, perhaps retrenching other related rights. Dr. J. Cherie Strawn with the Bliss Institute of Applied Politics at the University of Akron and Kyle Kondik with Sabado's Crystal Ball at the University of Virginia Center for Politics. I appreciate both of you joining me and uh, thanks so much for this conversation. I guess we'll all be watching tonight. Thank you. Absolutely. All right, we're going to take a quick break, and when we return, we're going to talk about a filmmaker's camp for Northeast Ohio's youth that's going on right now. I'm Jenny Hamill. This is The Sound of Ideas. We'll be right back. At 929, it's The Sound of Ideas right here on WKSU, Ideastream Public Media. We are your source for NPR news and information. Thanks for being with us for part of your Thursday. Support for WKSU comes from you, our listener, as well as the following. Tri-C, providing in-demand training for employers looking to elevate team members. Students can earn industry-recognized certificates in eight weeks or less in workforce training programs. Information on scholarships and more at tri-c.edu slash workforce. The Cleveland Orchestra presenting A Salute to America with the Blossom Festival Band, followed by fireworks, July 3rd at Blossom Music Center. Tickets at clevelandorchestra.com. Your calls, emails, and comments are coming through. We hear you. You care about fact-based news, the area's latest arts happenings, and accessible, honest storytelling, and we take you there. With your continued support, we promise to deliver local news that matters to you. Donate to IdeaStream Public Media. Visit ideastream.org slash donate today. You're with the Sound of Ideas from IdeaStream Public Media. I'm Jenny Hamill. Thanks so much for being with us this hour. Making films as a young person is not only fun. It's a chance to be creative, build confidence, and work as a team. But it can be an expensive form of art. And film summer camps can cost thousands of dollars for families. When Cleveland area filmmaker Eric Swinderman realized that his Young Filmmakers Academy was limiting who could attend, especially students of color, he made the decision to eliminate tuition for all students starting this summer. Now he says it's the most diverse class yet, with more than a third of enrollments being minority students and more than half female. Joining me now to talk about his camp and the art of filmmaking is Eric Swinderman, Executive Director of the Young Filmmakers Academy. Eric, thanks so much for coming in. Hey, thanks for having me in. Yeah. And Sophia Castellanos, a student with the Young Filmmakers Academy, an actress, and a rising junior at Hawkins School. Good morning, Sophia. Good morning. Thanks Th for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming in. If you'd like to join the conversation with a question or a comment, call 866 578 
888-888-0903. You can email us at soi at ideastream.org, or you can tweet us. We are at Sound of Ideas. Eric, how does this summer camp work? So the summer camp <clears throat> is divided into three weeks, uh, pre-production, production, and post-production. Uh, makes a lot of sense. So the first week, the kids are writing the script that they're going to film in the second week. They only have three days to write the script. Wow. Because by Thursday of the week, we have to be casting. And by Friday, we have to be in breaking down the script and figuring out props, wardrobe, locations, all of that. Then we move into week two, where that's where our crew come in and our actors come in and they, they film all the scenes. They have five days to do that. So they essentially have 25 hours to shoot this movie. Wow. And then we go into week three and that's where we do all of our editing, our digital effects, all of that. And we, we color correct and all that. And we have to get that ready for our world premiere in August. So that's really, that's baptism by fire. I mean, you're just throwing them into the process. It sounds incredibly fun to learn all of that. Yeah, we tell parents, this is not soccer camp. This is not drop your kids off and pick them up later and hope that they just are tired. It's, it's a job. They have a job to do. We have a release date. <laughs> that's so exciting. So when you began the camp back in 2017, seven years ago, when did you start to realize that the young people that you were including wasn't as, I don't know, diverse or representative of the region as you wanted it to be. Right. So we're in Lakewood. Uh -huh. And uh, so our surrounding communities are Rocky River, Bay Village, you know, so it's going to be a little homogenous, obviously. Mm -hmm. But then it was 2020. We're getting ready to film in co during COVID. Yeah, true. And we decided to not do a script writing session because we were doing everything outside during covid so we wrote we were doing a an adaptation of a children's book that i wrote um because we it was a book about sort of prejudice because at the time the george floyd um uh, situation was happening and that was what everybody was talking about and we said we need to talk about that and then i was looking and thinking how do we have any credibility to talk about George Floyd or racism or anything like that when we are very, you know, homogenized as a as a group, as an organization? So that so was very white. Yes, very white. And and I was like, so that's why we ended up doing sort of a parable that that summer. It was a fairy tale about prejudice. But that sort of started the conversation of we are not getting a diverse enough group of kids. So we launched a diversity scholarship program. Nice. Uh, Sherwin Williams uh, co-sponsored that. They were basically matching what we would put into it. Um, and Sophia, who's here today, uh, was our first recipient of that. Uh, so Sophia, first of all, you were able to join the camp through this grant. Yes. What was your interest in filmmaking acting, all of this prior to, what made you want to apply? Uh, so I had actually been a part of one of their films as an extra, and I really enjoyed being on that set. It was my first ever like professional set. How fun. Um, and I was really into acting and behind the scenes as well, like being behind the camera. And I thought, well, this camp would be a great opportunity because it has all of those opportunities and experiences. Um, there's everything. You can build sets, you can be behind the camera, you can be in front of the camera, you can direct, you can do sound, lighting, all of it. And so you got the grant. Yes. And you were able to go to the camp. Yes. And uh, one way I've seen, we're going to play a clip and I've seen some, um, a clip of you and your performance <laughs> was very good. So Thank you. Um, you, I hear you're in films now that are playing at the Cleveland International Film yeah. Festival. Tell me about your success so far. Yeah, so um, it actually started with Eric because that was the first like professional set opportunity. And from there, um, I kind of just started networking and getting to know people in the Cleveland area. Um, I do have a couple films that were in the festival, um, two of them with wonderful local directors. And um, yeah, it's been a great experience. I'm always looking for new opportunities and meeting new people. Okay, let's go ahead and hear from Sophia performing in this 2022 film, Trial of Errors. We've heard a lot of evidence today, and most of it is pretty incriminating. On one hand, it's indisputable that the defendant's generation has done some pretty awful things. On the other hand, they did give us computers and space travel, which have led to much of the technology we enjoy today. 
Why, without satellites, we couldn't stream SpongeBob SquarePants on the iPhone 17 while learning the new TikTok dance. And I think one of the things the audience doesn't get because they don't not seen the video is you're looking at this older guy yes. while you're saying this. Someone from an older generation who obviously you're saying has done some some bad things right. as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, there's humor in it. It's a nuanced performance. I, I was like, oh, she's really good. Thank you. <laughs> so, Eric, what made you want to teach young people like Sophia in Northeast Ohio about filmmaking? And is it really more than learning how to work a camera or edit? Yeah. So the big thing that I always say about filmmaking is it's not working a camera or this or that. It's storytelling. Mm -hmm. Right. And there are only seven basic stories that you can tell. Mm -hmm. um, and they've all been told. So you have to find your own voice and find a new way to tell the same stories that have been told over and over and over for generations. So we really preach about storytelling uh, and having a voice and having something to say. Um, most of our films have some kind of underlying message. Um, obviously, that one uh, that, that we just heard was about the younger generation and their feelings about what the world looks like to them and what their future holds. Um, and so that's pretty poignant for a bunch of, um, you know, our average age in the camp is 14. Um, so wow. for them to, you know, want to say those things and write those kinds of things, um, that's, that's really impressive. And when you look at Hollywood and how much Hollywood is trying to diversify and make films about and by people who are more reflective of our society, I mean, I guess, did that feed into kind of your desire to make sure that your camp and maybe some budding filmmakers, that pool is more diverse as well? Absolutely. Um, it just, you know, the diversity scholarship program started and it was... Um, Filmmaking in full color was our tagline. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I just, p the world is a better place when, when all, everybody's included, right? Every, when all voices are heard and all stories are told and all perspectives are considered. So we just wanted to make sure that we were doing that. I mean, that's sort of how I am as a person. So mm -hmm. the organization is really, I think, a reflection of my personal views. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but then we try to hand that off to the kids and let them take over with it. But the general idea of how we want these kids to uh, communicate to the world is through, you know, being able to be diversified and, and having that inclusion. So, Sophia, I'm curious as a, as a young person, um, what has the camp given you aside from getting back to getting better with your acting yeah. skills has there been certain things that you've garnered from this camp yes um i've learned a lot of things that are really important not just in film but also in like life in sure. general what are some of those yeah um it's important to be able to have directness but also be, do it in a way that's respectful mm -hmm. um that's a big thing with like directing sure um i've also learned a lot of independence in this film camp you are treated like an adult you have responsibilities it is a job and so i've learned that you have things that you need to do and to do them the way that you know how to do them so let me ask you this. Are you now trying to be an actor in Hollywood? <laughs> Have you? Has he spawned something in you? I definitely do want to do acting. It's um, definitely something I really love. Um, so kind of wherever my acting journey takes me, I'm just following it. Okay, great. Yeah, there's no doubt in my mind that if that's where she wants to go, that's where <laughs> she'll end up. That's great. Like not just the talent, but the the attitude, the um, drive, the drive, the maturity level. I mean, when we I met you what three years ago, yeah, um, and just was blown away then. And I know she emailed me once, and I was like, this looks like an email that someone from corporate <laughs> would send me. You know, yeah. So she'll get where she wants to go. Thank you. Again, if you want to ask a question or give a thought, please call us 866-578-0903, or you can email us at soi at ideastream.org. So, Eric, you're, you're running this camp, so you obviously have a teacher's heart, but uh, you're also working on movies. Yes. So tell us what you're working on right now. So I'm working um, with a, another organization called Crash Cat media um, with Mark Hamer, Richard Maurer. They're um, phenomenal um, producers out of Brexville, and they have a company called um, uh, 
Garage Creative Media or Garage Creative Services, and they're one of the top you know post production houses in you know in Ohio, and they did all the post production on my last movie, The Enormity of Life, oh. and we really had a great relationship there, and they're branching out to produce features, and 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 I'm a writer, so I'm I'm a write I'm writing and executive producing two films with them in the next year. Shot here. Uh, shot. We have. N- we're definitely in Ohio because you know we're all about the tax credit. Sure. Um, so, um, but we have uh, we're still early on in that. We're still writing the scripts uh, and and creating the stories and stuff. But um, we're hoping to be filming by end of this year or January of next year. So let me ask you this: Superman's being filmed. I'm, I'm mm-hmm. seeing stuff on my Instagram feed all the time from these Cleveland uh, pages that I follow. So it's exciting for mm-hmm. for uh, the locals. Uh, how do you feel about that production happening here? So I, it's obviously it's obviously a good thing for the city. Obviously, I just read a report that the films that have been coming in since basically since the Avengers have brought in like over a billion dollars into the economy. Yeah. So that's great. That's great for the city. Um, I have mixed feelings about how it is for the film community at large. Okay. Um, because. You know, obviously they're not casting a Cleveland or a Superman. <laughs> obviously they're not casting a Cleveland to direct the film. And there are definitely a lot of people who get jobs, especially the union workers, the IATSE workers who are here, who are constantly getting hired onto these sets. But, you know, someone like Sophia uh, is not going to have a, a you know, real big chance at getting a line in Superman. She might get to be a background extra. Um, so it's really great, but it's, it's sort of overhyped a little bit, on, I think, on how much it actually helps the local actors or the local crew at large. There's a, a very small amount of people in Cleveland who are actually going to get regular work out of these mm-hmm. projects. Most of them, I know, work uh, regular jobs and then have to take off work. They have to basically choose jobs that they can take off whenever they want and not care if they get fired <laughs> because mm-hmm. they have to um, – take off because they can't turn down Superman, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, even our um, one of our longtime uh, staff members at Young Filmmakers Academy, Jeffrey Lang, who's been with us since day one, um, is not able to do the camp this year because he got on, on Superman um, doing production design and stuff like That's that. That's exciting. So, um, so, um, so yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a mixed bag of emotions for me. It's great for the city and it's great for the few... Um, but by and large, they're bringing in people sure. from L.A., and, in other words, to do the work here. And that's sort of the opposite of what my production company does. Mm-hmm. Good points. Okay, we have two minutes left. I'd love to hear about your red carpet premiere. Sure. And what that's going to look like. Sure. August 23rd at the Sari Feldman Auditorium in Parma. That's at the Cuyahoga County Public Library. They have a beautiful facility, a big 300-seat mm. uh, auditorium. This is our third year doing our um, It's uh, from 6 to 8. You can come in, walk the red carpet, um, see the two films that are made for the summer camp because we have our beginners, our kiddos, 8 to 11-year-olds who are in camp right now as we speak, and then our advanced camp. And then you'll see also a few other films uh, that are made throughout the year by our after-school programs. Uh, It's about a two-hour program. The kids get to do a QA, and a They get to walk the red carpet. The paparazzi take their pictures. The media is usually there. And all the money uh, that we raise for that, it's basically our big we're a nonprofit 501c3 sure. so that's our big annual fundraiser basically so um we're always uh open to sponsors to who want to who want to put their name on the on the movie on the on the event sure. and obviously tickets uh will go on sale next week and Sophia, will you be going? I will definitely be going. I'm super excited to see all of the hard work that people have been putting in. Okay, great. And how, how's your family uh, feeling about all your all your, all the film work you've done? They are so supportive, and I'm so appreciative for that. Um, they're always there, whether it's bringing me to set, helping me with auditions, all of it. Yeah. Well, I'm ex- very excited for your future. Thank you so much. And uh, Eric, it's a great thing that you're doing. So filmmaker Eric Swinderman, an actress and Hawkins School junior, Sophia Castellanos, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Time now for a quick break. On the other side, another installment of our music podcast, Shuffle. This is The Sound of Ideas. I'm Jenny Hamill. We'll be right back.
At 946, it's the Sound of Ideas right here on WKSU Idea Stream Public Media, your source for NPR news and information. Thursday night may be the first presidential debate of the 2024 general election, but it's the fourth meeting between President Biden and former President Trump. We'll preview CNN's presidential debate and tally the sum of points made during NPR's special coverage and analysis with Steve Inskeep at 9 p.m. Eastern. That's on the next All Things Considered from NPR News. You can join us for All Things Considered with your local host, Amanda Rabinowitz. That starts at 4 o'clock this afternoon right here on WKSU. It's the Sound of Ideas from Ideastream Public Media. I'm Jenny Hamill. Thanks for spending the hour with us. Northeast Ohio musician Mike Tolan has been quietly releasing his post-folk songs as talons for over a decade. For this week's shuffle, T- Tolan sat down with Ideastream Public Media's Amanda Rabinowitz for a conversation and live performance. Then the next day we made for the coast With the gas can in the trunk, a gun under the seat and hole. Mike Tolan grew up in the rural Tuscarawas County city of New Philadelphia, where he says he found inspiration in the alternative music CD collection at the local library. He found an outlet for his own music in high school. There weren't a whole lot of options in Tuscarawas County growing up, but I feel like the result was that there was this small group of people that were into interesting music. And there was also a really great, like, open mic situation in Dover called the Open Mouth. You know, that's where I sang in front of people for the first time. Tolan became a fixture in the Kent music scene in the late 90s, joining the widely popular instrumental band The Six Part Seven. Yeah, I mean, I moved to Kent after high school, largely for the music scene, which was also centered around a record label called Donut Friends, which was run by Jamie Stillman, who went on to start Earthquaker Devices. So there's a lot of people that have been active in like making this something of Northeast Ohio music for a long time. My friends and I had a band called Silent Command, and we played a show at the Europe Gyro, eventually tried out and joined Six Part Seven. For the last decade, he's been releasing music as talents and performing with his wife, Summer, and Jacob Trombetta. The experimental songs weave in sound recorded in various settings. A lot of it is like just trying to place a song in a certain space. Like a lot of recording that I've done has been with a microphone that picks up everything and trying to get the sound of the room that you're in, the sound of the whatever's going on outside. And to me, it just helps like make it feel more real. It also makes it more interesting. Like I, These are kind of like folk songs, but I'm not a huge fan of like traditional folk music. I like a lot of experimental music. I, lo- I like a lot of bands that use field recordings and stuff. heavily into his songwriting during the pandemic, releasing three albums in two years. I broke down today at Whole Foods. It's my car is getting full. What am I going to do? What am I I mean, it was an extremely difficult time, and I guess for me, I have kind of used songs as a way to get through whatever I'm dealing with in my life. You know, going back to the beginning of this project, a lot of it was just trying to work through things, and somehow by making it into a song and playing it to myself over and over again, it would help somehow get through things. But, you know, with COVID, I felt like a very 
strong and understandable urge um, for everybody to ignore that is happening and, and forget that it happened as soon as possible. And I had felt like I wanted to write some songs about that era because it is very important and consequential to basically the rest of our lives. It's strange listening to those songs now and playing some of them because, you know, while we're not over it by any means, we're in a different era now and it's hard to imagine life in like early 2020, but it, it happened and it changed all of us. Melting down on the couch, holding on to my phone for dear life, worrying about my kid. Tolan performed a new post-pandemic song called Summer and Russell. I love the sound of the insects at night. Can't that be enough for me? I look up at the sky through the leaves And I want to following, despite rarely promoting his music or performing live. In 2018, the publication Vice did a feature article on him titled The Quiet Brilliance of Talons, Ohio's Most Underappreciated Songwriter. He talked about how that came about. I've been really lucky in this project in that there's been um, a lot of people that have supported it the whole time I've done it. I've had a few friends that happen to work for places like Vice, like I think Rob Arcan wrote that article and they decided to use their platform to give some attention to my music so I'm really grateful for that I'm I'm not a good self promoter I like working like pretty small with everything so I'm always grateful if anything pops up What happens to punks when they grow up Do they still dress punk do they still listen to punk Do they show off their old tattoos or cover them up? Tolan describes his song New York Hardcore as being about middle-aged confusion, and he reflected about how the scene has changed and his place in it. I'm not really sure. I feel like I'm just kind of, I've gotten older and stopped being engaged, and the scene continues on. But there's all, I mean, I'm always, like, super impressed with how many People are still doing house shows, and, you know, I'm still an appreciator of the scene. (laughs) A lot of the people that I make music with and have been, like, in community with, like, we don't really like the commercial aspect of music. We do it for other reasons. And so a lot of my music, you know, basically all of it, I've just always kind of given away. I heard about New York hardcore from an article in the New Yorker. Reminded me of being a teen, playing bass in the mirror to rage against the machine, raging against the machine, raging against the machine. Tolan, along with his wife, Summer, who are now based in Chagrin Falls, say playing music is an important ritual. For me, it's just a thing that I do. I mean, it's definitely like a stress reliever. It's the thing that I like to do at the end of the day. There's a certain amount of it that's like, just feels like it has to happen. I love recording. Like, I love home recording. It's, it's one of the, the funnest activities to me. So I like working on projects. I like sharing them with my friends. He'll, even if he's like dead tired, it's almost like meditation where he's like, Or like how people are like, I have to go to the gym. I have to play music to feel right at the end of the day. Baby, 
Don't you worry so much Cause under our clothes we're wild still In addition to talents, Tolan says he's been working on a new instrumental project with some musician friends called Greening. They finished recording an album and are planning a release date. The fall in your hair getting long You tell me it's over your shoulders now Mike Tolan joined Shuffle for this conversation and performance, along with Summer Tolan and Jacob Trombetta. You can find links and follow the podcast at ideastream.org slash shuffle. I'm Amanda Rabinowitz, Ideastream Public Media. So I build these stupid crushes on All the pretty girls here And I sing songs like Tonight I on an old flame Cause in the cold This interview and performance were part of IdeaStream and the Cleveland Museum of Art's third Thursday music series held at the Transformer Station. You can join the next live event on July 18th with WCLV's Bill O'Connell and the classically trained Opus 216. And as always, Shuffle is your backstage pass to Northeast Ohio's independent music scene. It's produced by Amanda Rabinowitz with help from Brittany Nader. You can hear Shuffle Thursdays here on WKSU or check out all the past episodes by subscribing wherever you get your podcasts. Now to get the last word on today's topic, send an email to soi at ideastream.org. We're on Twitter now, X at Sound of Ideas. You can follow me at Jenny Hamill underscore or on Instagram. I'm at Jenny Hamill Ideastream. Tomorrow on The Sound of Ideas, it's the Friday Reporters Roundtable with host Mike McIntyre. This week he'll begin with a short recap of tonight's debate with Baldwin Wallace political science expert Tom Sutton. And he'll discuss the rest of the week's news with Ideastream reporters Gabriel Kramer and Abigail Botar, along with our State House News Bureau Chief Karen Kassler in Columbus. If you missed any portion of the program, you can find us online. You can listen to the Sound of Ideas podcast wherever you get your podcasts. There will not be a rebroadcast tonight because NPR will be providing live special coverage of the CNN presidential debate simulcast tonight at 9 on 89.7 WKSU. Monday, join us for a conversation with residents working to revive Cleveland's Buckeye Woodhill neighborhood. And I'll chat with the head of PBS about the future of public media. I'm Jenny Hamill. Thanks so much for listening. And I will speak with you again on Monday as we close a little more music from Mike Tolan. Here's Robo. The Sound of Ideas is produced by Rachel Rood, Lee Barr, and Drew Mazius. Chris Dudley and Samson Auble provide technical assistance. Jay Nungesser is at the controls of the Ohio Channel broadcast. And our host is Jenny Hamill. Thanks so much for tuning in. You're listening to 89.7 WKSU Kent, a public media service licensed to Kent State University and operated by IdeaStream Public Media.